Okay, so um, today, as promised, uh, I'm going to show you how to separate uh, an integral without any mu dependence. And um, we're going to do this in a toy example. Um, and uh, it'll probably take the whole time. Uh, I have some stuff at the end that I'll either tell you at the end if we get there or next time. But um, it's going to be the same style as the last lecture, so I really want to show you uh, the majority of the gory details, and we're actually going to build on uh, some of the things we did last time in the first part where we use the RGE to resum the large logs associated with the running of the cortic. Um, so uh, that'll play a role here. So I'll just port those results over from last time, um, and uh, that should all be, be pretty obvious when we get there. Um, I want to very briefly mention this excellent question that was raised about uh, this one plus log. Oh, this chalk's much better. Mu squared over m squared. Um, and being able to choose the, uh, the renormalization at the high scale to cancel this, this was in the context of the quadratic divergence problem. Um, so I, uh, I thought about it a lot yesterday, chatted with, uh, uh, with my postdoc, Marat Freitas, who's an expert in this stuff. Uh, and um, yeah, so what I said, what I, what I was guessing was the right answer, I think is not true. Uh, it's not true that if you move mu around, it'll show up somewhere else, which is why I couldn't think of where it might show up. Um, the thing that is true here, and I, I actually don't, I don't want to waste a lot of time on this. I'd be more than happy to chat about it either at the end of today's lecture or one-on-one -on -one or in a group uh, afterwards. But um, this is basically an accident of me choosing such a simple example. Um, for, for example, if you had a realistic UV completion, you're going to have a series of particles with masses of order m. And then there's not going to be a single scale you could choose to cancel all those masses. So that's kind of the, the dumbest thing to, to point out about this, is that, um, that you really are just able to do this for one mass. And, and all UV completions of the Higgs sector are going to have multiple mass scales involved. Uh, the other thing is that if you imagine doing this to higher order, then you're going to be adjusting the, uh, the mu parameter order by order to cancel off this correction. And while you can, in principle, do that, if you're going to become exponentially sensitive to loop corrections. You're going to be mixing lower orders with higher orders. And it's all for a very specific choice of scale. And we know the scale is not physical. And so, um, so yes, in this toy case, maybe you could construct some convoluted slice of the renormalization parameter space where the threshold correction was zero. But it's pretty artificial. Um, so uh, you may object to what I just said. I'm not, I, uh, I encourage you to come and bug me about it later or if you don't understand what I said. But um, I've got a lot to cover today. So uh, I didn't want to leave this hanging, but I, I do want to move on from it, at least for the moment. Um, OK. These erasers suck. Um, anything, any questions or comments, uh, especially related to the first part of last lecture? Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, anybody? <laughs> now you have to come. <laughs> um, yes, uh, t-shirt color. Uh, so uh, yeah, any, anything, uh, anything bothering you? Um, OK, good. So the matching procedure that we used last time at one loop to, uh, to calculate this uh, threshold correction to the mass, we're going to do that again today in a different context. Um, so. Uh, the whole point of doing all those exercises was that, um, that a lot of the framing is going to, I hope, now look very familiar. And then uh, you'll see some cool stuff happen. So maybe I should say where we're going. Um, so here's our model. Uh, do I have it written on this page? Oh, no, that's, yes. Here's our model. So the full theory Lagrangian includes our friend from last time, little phi to the fourth plus a new term that couples our light scalar cube to the heavy scalar. And uh, it'll be very clear why I'm picking this kind of weird interaction in a, in a moment. Uh, and then as uh, last time, oh, and I'm missing minus signs. Uh, as, as was true in last time, this has a little mass, uh, a mass little m. This has a mass big M. Okay, I'm just, um, it's the same, the same particles we've been studying uh, all week. And so what's going to happen is, unsurprisingly, we're going to compute phi phi to phi phi at threshold. Um, and we're going to power count a little lambda, which is little m over big M. 
and our symmetries are Lorentz plus, uh, there's actually a Z2 that takes phi to minus phi and big phi to minus big phi simultaneously. Uh, so this tells us what our low energy effective theory looks like, right? It's going to look like, uh, it's going to be a theory with only a light scalar of mass at little m, and then a tower of operators um, so we have uh, minus C4 over 4 factorial little phi fourth, minus C6 over 6 factorial little phi to the 6, suppressed by the scale m squared. Sorry, that's not, let me rewrite that. And then, of course, in principle, there's a tower of higher and higher operators. Okay? Yeah, because um, this this is just a choice of normalization. Um, but the idea here is that we're building, we're going to match our full theory to the effective theory at some mu high, uh, which is going to have a natural scale of order m, and then we're going to run down to mu low, which has a natural scale of order little m. So since the matching is happening here, this is the highest scale in the theory. So that's the the mass scale we just okay. use to uh, to make everything dimension four. Okay. No. Yeah, it's, uh, it really is, um, I mean, if you like, really, it's just a choice of definition of C6, okay? But the, uh, as we'll see, the point of matching this way is that um, when we match to the theory at mu high, um, we're going to generate something which is just a, a pure number and a coupling constant uh, divided by m squared, okay? So I'm preempting where we're going by normalizing it in, in this useful way. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you could put anything you want here, and the first time I wrote up the notes, I didn't put it. But this is the thing that people normally do, is they make the mass dimension really explicit using the matching scale, uh, using the, the whatever the heavy physical scale you're integrating out is, okay? Um, yeah, great question. So, um, the, so first of all, um, we can look at this, and we can ask about power counting, okay? So, uh, in our effective theory, right, I don't uh, What's the, uh, what's the scaling going to be for, uh, for this operator? To the... Yeah. So, um, so this, op well, yeah, so this operator scales like uh, lambda to the fourth. Yeah, the operator. Oh, sorry, you thought I meant the field. Yeah, so the operator scales like lambda to the fourth, so then when you integrate against d4x, this is the leading order term, the zeroth order term, okay? Um, so this term uh, integrated over d4x, we can insert an infinite number of times like we did yesterday, right? Um, and this term is going to be higher order in lambda, right? So this is going to go like lambda squared. Yes? Do you get a plus sign there, or have you like absorbed that in C6? Do I get a plus sign? So, um, so the signs here are just a convention. Yeah, so uh, it's... It, and we'll see actually when we match that we're going to get the opposite sign. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just, this tends to be the standard, uh, the standard sign convention for the potential. Um, but, and it shows up in the Feynman rule, so we'll have to track those minus signs to get the right answer. Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, this is going to play a huge role in today's lecture, is that we're going to have uh, leading power and subleading power contributions to the thing we're going to calculate, to this phi phi scattering at one loop, okay? And so we're going to have to be really careful about the way we deal with this expansion in lambda. And I'm going to show that that's going to come up in a very concrete way uh, as we work through. Okay. So let me set the stage. I said this already last time, so you probably remember. Um, we have the following diagram in this theory. Okay. And the reason that I chose this diagram is because I wanted, this is, as far as I know, the simplest case that's going to give us a, um, a heavy light loop, okay, together, so that we're going to be able to get from this loop logs of lambda, okay? Um, so let me just show you how this works in the full theory. Um, so let's do 
T channel and U channel first, right? So remember from last time we talked about this a little bit, I'm at threshold, so the kinematics for T and U channel, there's zero momentum flowing through this loop, right? Because it's P1 minus P3 and we're at threshold, okay? We'll do the S channel separately and we have to be careful with that factor because we care about the finite terms now. Whereas last time, we neglected that because we only cared about the UV divergences, okay? Um, so I'll, work, I'll, I'll show you that carefully uh, in just a moment. But um, let's just look at this diagram and see what happens. It's pretty easy to, uh, to solve. So we have a 2 because there's two channels. We have an alpha squared because there's two alphas. Mu to the 2 epsilon, integral dl, 1 over L squared minus little m squared, 1 over L squared minus big M squared. Okay. And this notation, remember, is my d, d to the dl uh, L over 2 pi to the d, right? Just to not have to write that a million times. Okay. Yes? In the proof theory, why you don't include like, uh, big, uh, small phi square, big phi square? Um, so uh, just because the, because um, it, it, I'm doing this particular case, because uh, this gives me a log that I would need to separate, OK? Um, It'll be, I think that'll be a little clearer in a moment. If I had that theory, then this would be a loop just with heavy particles. Both these M's would be the heavy particles, and nothing interesting would happen. We would just use the exact same matching techniques that we used last time, okay? So there'd be some finite correction, but there wouldn't be a log without a mu in it that would, be, uh, that would require this new technology to resum, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so what's gonna, yeah. I guess I meant to say this a little earlier, but, but this is fine. So, um, so there are two things I want to say before I evaluate the integral. The first is we can just ask about the divergent structure, right? So we take L to be large, and so we've got four L's in the numerator, four L's in the denominator, so we've got a log divergence in the UV, okay? So we're going to expect something like renormalization group evolution is going to be required to resum those UV logs, right? Just like we did last time. And in fact, there's going to be a mu-dependent UV log um, that's going to appear at leading order in the power counting that will get resummed by running the quartic coupling in the effective theory. Yes? Yes? So why is there no external Oh, by, by assumption. So I picked my process. So I want to keep it as easy as possible. Um, so this, this is uh, computing phi-phi scattering at threshold, OK? So it doesn't, so yeah, so if you wanted a finite momentum process, you'd have to do a harder calculation. But it's in principle straightforward. You just keep the momentum around as you're, as you're suggesting. Um, it just makes a mess of things, but, um, but that's fine. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, so um, the threshold means the matching at big M. Okay, yeah. All right, so we've got a UV divergence. So we already know to expect we're going to get a log of mu proportional to alpha squared, and, and we'll see that comes out, OK? What about in the IR? Do we have an IR divergence? When the loop momentum goes on shell in both. Um, or one Can't do that simultaneously, right? So I take L to 0 to look at for the IR divergence, right? And I have masses for both of these propagators, so the IR is regulated, OK? Um, so that tells me that um, my theory, this integral, better give me a result which is finite as I take little m to zero in particular, okay? And so that is the intuitive reason, if you don't care about all of the, uh, all the little tricks I'm going to do to evaluate the integral in a moment, you would know, walking into this, you should get a UV divergence with a log mu and probably a log mu over big M because you're in the UV, so this is the heavier scale. And you should get something with a log little m, but it needs to be regulated as I take little m to zero. And that implies that, so the IR structure of this integral tells us already we should expect that any log with a little m in it, so any log of lambda should be proportional to lambda or a higher power of lambda. Okay? So, right, because this goes to zero as lambda goes to zero, it doesn't go to infinity as lambda goes to zero, it, like it would if it was just a log. Okay? So already, just by looking at this simple integral, we can learn a lot about the structure of what we expect to come out. And in particular, we see that we need to go to subleading power if we want to see these, uh, these new kinds of logs that only have physical scales in them. Okay? So the, the nice thing about this example is it's going to give me the opportunity to show you both how to separate scales in a log like this, 
but also how to deal with subleading power operators and how to track the power counting. Okay? So the power counting is going to play a major role in the story today for exactly this reason. Okay? Any questions? If you get this, you're probably going to get the rest. Um, good. L to zero, if neither M is zero, I mean, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It means that, and, and then you take M to zero, but if you take little M to zero, then you can't take L to zero safely. That's exactly the point. So, um, so I do this integral over all values of L, which includes zero, yeah. okay? And then I get something that depends on little M and big M and mu. Okay. And what I'm saying is, because I integrated big L, I already know that this can't give me a divergence when m goes to zero, right, for exactly the argument I gave. Oh, okay. Okay. And, um, yeah, so there's one other thing that's going to happen here. So this is the other critical piece of the story today, um, which is, what, which is the, the, really the reason to go through all the factors of two, which is, again, it's related to taking little m to zero, okay? So what you should really think about what we're doing here is, when we match at the high scale, okay, so here's where we're going to match. And then we're going to run. Okay? So when we match at the high scale, we're at really big M, and little m shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't play any role, okay? Because the, the relevant region of the momentum integral is really around big M, little m's a tiny little perturbation on top of that, okay? And indeed, we're going, as I, as I promised, I'm going to show you that we're going to get a, a UV log with mu over m, big M in it, not mu over little m. Okay? There will be no little m dependence in our renormalization group evolution. Uh, or in the, um, yeah, as you'll see, in the log structure that leads to the renormalization group evolution at the high scale. Okay? And that's really nice because that means when we match at the high scale, then all, log, all of the threshold logs, which have mu high over m in them, are going to be easy to trivially make small by choosing mu high of order m, like we did yesterday. Okay? Um, but that means that we can't have little m show up in a log. All the log little m dependence has to come from the, a, a combination of the running down to the low scale and the evaluation of the one-loop corrections at the low scale okay? in the effective theory. So here's the critical thing. Here's the true magic of effective theory. I've, I'm, I'm very excited to finally show you the thing that, that's so amazing about these techniques, which is that you can capture all of the non-analytic behavior in the IR parameters using the effective theory that looks nothing like the full theory. This is the full theory. This is the effective theory. And what I'm going to show you is that by matching and running, we can separate off all the log little m's, trade that for a renormalization parameter that we can use to run to the low scale, and then we're going to do finite corrections at the low scale, and we're going to get our log little m's back. Okay? So what I'm going to do, the full, the full story today is, it's right here. We're going to start with this theory. We're going to compute this process. Because we're interested in seeing these log lambdas, we're going to work to uh, subleading power. Okay? And we're going to match this Lagrangian onto this one at the high scale. Well, first we're just going to calculate in the full theory. Okay? Then, so we're going to know what the, what the full theory answer looks like. And then we're going to say, oh crap, there's a log of little m over big M. It could get large if the parameters are, are really widely separated. So I, I would like to be able to resum it. I'd like to understand the techniques to do that. So then we're going to match. That's going to separate off the big, log, uh, the big M logs from the little m logs. We're going to run to the low scale, and we're going to calculate the IR corrections uh, to the process at the low scale. And those will give us back our logs of little m. And then we're going to expand the renormalization group evolution, which resummed large logs, to leading log order, and we're going to see magically that it reproduces the full theory result. Okay? So this complicated matching and running procedure um, is, uh, is it's, I hope by the end, it's going to be very clear uh, what it's buying you. Okay? So it really buys you two things. It buys you the ability to um, do RGE improvements, okay? but it also buys you the ability to only work with single scale integrals because the, um, often these multi-scale integrals are, are not possible to do analytically, whereas the single-scale integrals tend to all be analytically tractable. Okay, so we're going to be able to get a beautiful analytic result in this simple case. We could have done everything, but tomorrow when we do SCT, there, there is no analytic result for the full theory. We're going to use some techniques that I'll teach you to, um, to sort of calculate the thing piecemeal to leading, uh, to leading order in the power counting. 
And, um, and, so, and then the same exact techniques will be used to resum logs there. Okay? So this is a toy example, right? I've been emphasizing that a lot, but it's, it, it includes all of the salient features of the more complicated examples. Okay? So. Any questions about the big picture? Because the rest of the lecture is just going to be factors of two. All right, let's go. So what do we do when we have denominators like this? Feynman parameters. So we have 2 alpha squared mu to the 2 epsilon integral dl, integral from 0 to 1 dx, 1 over l squared minus x little m squared plus 1 minus x big M squared squared. And you just can read the answer out of Peskin for, for this Dimreg integral, OK? And you get um, i2 alpha squared over 16 pi squared integral 0 to 1 dx times 1 over epsilon plus log of mu hi uh, squared. Actually, can I ask for, so w will anyone be confused if I'm not dealing with the bar difference, right? We're always in MS bar, so I'm always unbarred here and barred when I'm inside a log. Is that going to cause any problems for anyone? Okay. I'm not going to write the bars. It'll save me a lot of writing. Um, okay. So we've got mu high squared over x m squared plus 1 minus x big M squared. And then if you're not great at integrals like I am, then uh, uh, I mean that I'm not great at them, then you plug that into Mathematica, because that's what we do, right? And it gives you uh, i2 alpha squared over 16 pi squared, 1 over epsilon minus m squared over big M squared minus little m squared log of mu high over little m squared plus big M squared, big M squared minus little m squared log mu high, oh, these squared, squared over big M squared. Okay? So at this point, uh, it doesn't look like what I promised because I've got uh, log of mu high over little m squared here, okay? Um, but the first thing I want to notice before I, I manipulate this for you is that uh, I want you to see our starting point was symmetric in little m and big M, right? And sure enough, the sanity check on this result is that it's currently symmetric in little m and big M. Okay, so just take a moment to see that, right? The minus sign happens because you flip the denominator and you just flip the m's here, right? It's all good. Um, so now we can use the magic of adding zero, yep, to write minus m squared, big M squared minus little m squared log mu high squared over little m squared plus big M squared over big M squared minus little m squared log mu high squared over big M squared. Um, plus zero, which looks like little m squared over big M squared minus little m squared log mu high squared over big M squared minus the same thing, okay? Uh, and when you combine this all together, this gives you, um, oh yeah, uh, this gives you I, 2 alpha squared over 16 pi squared, 1 over epsilon plus log mu high, boy, my muser now, mu high squared over big M squared, um, sorry, little, that's a little m, no, it can't be, that's wrong in my notes, that's a big M squared plus little m squared over big M squared log little m squared over big M squared plus order lambda to the fourth. Okay? So note, I skipped a step. I hope it's okay. I just expanded in uh, little m over big M, so this, this denominator right, became a big M. Uh, I think that's the only thing I did 
uh, other than add these two things together. Okay. Um, so we have what I promised. We have this log, which is the oh. Uh, I leave it as an exercise to the reader. I mean, you get a big M squared and a little M squared. When you combine these things, it cancels. It's, it's, a, it's a minute of algebra if you just write it down. Um, good. So here, our expansion, right? That's why we have higher order terms, OK? So note, I skipped the one line with the full, with the full result, but I mean, it's trivially just there's a minus little m squared here, right? But I get, a, in principle, a tower of uh, lambda corrections here, OK? But we're going to work to only to, to order lambda to squared. Um, OK? The mu high is the renormalization scale. I'm doing this calculation at the high scale, OK? So it's just the renormalization parameter mu. Now, I'm labeling it mu high because we're going to have another mu show up in just a moment, OK? So we're going to have two different mu's. And those two mu's will be connected by the RGE. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. So this, right, this is the log I was talking about that's going to get absorbed through the running of the cortic in the effective theory. Um, and this is the log that we're interested in. Um, this is a great place to say, I don't think I said this yet, this example is a little artificial in the sense that this log actually can never get large because it's subleading power. Okay. All the techniques are going to be relevant to tomorrow where the log really can get large, right? But just don't let it confuse you. I'm doing this as a, a, uh, in all this detail as a, as a gory example with all the details so you can see how all the moving parts work. But then um, at the end of the day, it's actually you know, not, a, not a relevant calculation for, for a real resummation. Um, not that you would ever care about this theory anyway. It's just a toy. Um, OK. Here I'm not going to show you the details. All the steps are the same. It's just a, a little bit nastier integral. Um, so this is a homework exercise. Uh, I can give you a hint, which is if you tell Mathematica to assume that parameters are real, it gives you a useless answer. And if you tell Mathematica to not to assume anything, it gives you a useful form of the answer, which cost me a few hours last week. Um, so. But Mathematica in principle can give you this. So I recommend just going and plugging it in make, and convince yourself that I'm not lying. Let me write the. So I've got my same i alpha squared over 16 pi squared, 1 over epsilon plus log mu high squared over big M squared plus 1 plus little m squared over big M squared log little m squared over big M squared plus 2 plus order lambda to the fourth. OK, so right here with the S channel, I need to keep P1 and P2 at threshold. OK, um, but then I set P1 equals M comma 0, P2 equals M comma 0, right? That's why there's no S dependence here. OK, it just gives me little Ms. But it changes the answer. You know, it added this 1 and it added this 2 over here. OK. So yeah, please go uh, derive this for yourselves. It's a good little exercise. Um, all right, so I posed this homework question to you guys at the end of last lecture. There's another class of diagrams in the full theory that you need to get everything to work out. Can anybody figure it out? You want to give it a shot? <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Well, I know one of the diagrams that includes the heavy field, but All right. it looks kind of weird, so I'm not sure. It's a weird diagram. Yeah, um, so there's going to be the heavy propagator, uh huh, and you can put in, I can use the dash line here, yep. you can put in a bubble. Yeah, there, I think you got it. Very good. Awesome. Yep, that's the one. Thank you. Yeah. The integral of the loop doesn't have the high mass, though. That's right, and and this is actually this is it, it, it's cool that this happened in this example. I wasn't anticipating it, but um, but yeah, there's something f really interesting that happens in this theory, and you can see right. This is a diagram that we would we would never write in uh, normally because you can cut a propagator, right? 
Um, what's different about the effective theory is that we're actually expanding around the limit where this propagator is local. Okay? So you really should think of this as, uh, as having shrunk this propagator to a point, and then we're computing the leading correction from that. Okay? Um, so you really can't, there is no sense of cutting this, di of cutting this propagator and putting the diagram on shell. Um, the same kind of thing, by the way, happens here. Okay? We shrink this to a point, right? and we're going to get the same kind of structure in the effective theory. So there's two ways of generating what's going to be a phi to the fourth coupling off the phi to the sixth uh, operator, right? And so we can shrink this to a point, or we can shrink this tree level propagator to a point. Okay? Yeah? So, no, but this is just four phi's, right? So it's phi-phi scattering still. I mean, you just, you know, you can orient the diagram however you like, okay? And in fact, we need to, um, so here, right, we had three diagrams, two T-channel and one S-channel that was a little different. How many diagrams do we have here? Why? Six. Okay, I heard four, I heard six. Who wants to justify their answer? Well, I, I said six because the loop can either be on the final state side or initial state side, and then times another three because you can pick any of those three to be on the opposite end for two to two. So you can, uh, that, never enough, that's over counting then, isn't it? No, I, I'm going to stand by six. You're going to stand by six? Okay, any more? Four, four came out of somebody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very good. So, so you can, uh, the reason that you got confused is because you thought about the harder side. If you think about the easy side, then there's only four choices you could make here. So there's four of these, okay? Am I, do I need any other factors? There's a one half because of the loop there. Thank you. There's a half symmetry factor because it's one of these, uh, one of these real scalar loops, okay? Excellent. So we've got an extra two alpha squared. 1 over little m squared minus big M squared. Here I've put my, uh, my, my external particle on shell, okay? Right? So I'm at threshold. Got my mu high to the 2 epsilon. Uh, integral dl 1 over L squared minus M squared. The note, it survives this round. Minus I alpha squared over 8 pi squared little m squared over big M squared. 1 over epsilon minus log little m squared over mu hi squared plus 1. So we get, this is our quadratically divergent loop, right? So it, the only scale inside the loop is little m, so that we better get a little m squared out for the quadratic divergence. Yeah? And then our log can only depend on little m. Okay? Notice it's subleading power. Okay, so this doesn't spoil the story I was saying here. The leading power contribution, right? This is the thing you can resum with the RGE. You can do an infinite number of insertions of them. It only depends on big M. But the subleading logs, right? We can have a log of little m here. Now, as I'm about to show you in the matching step, all the logs of little m have to go away, right? If we had missed this diagram, then we wouldn't see that happen and we'd know that we were missing something, okay? So it's a nice diagnostic. The effective theory tells you at some level whether or not you got the right answer, okay? Well, it at least tells you whether or not you got the wrong answer. I'll put it that way. But that's better than nothing. Okay. So we can put all this together. Phi phi to phi phi. And this is now renormalized because I'm going to just drop the 1 over epsilons. I get i alpha squared over 16 pi squared, 3 log mu hi squared over big M squared, plus 1 plus little m squared over big M squared, 3 log m squared over big M squared, plus 2 log little m squared over mu hi squared. Okay, and I have in my notes to keep this. So let's keep this. Try not to erase it. Good, because we're
because we're going to come back. This is the thing we're now going to see how to reproduce using the effective theory matching, running, and, and low scale calculation. Okay? So this is the full amplitude plus including leading power and subleading power. Uh, no, good, good, good. Thank you. This is only the alpha squared corrections. So we'll include that. The, we're just going to use the results from last time to include that. But yeah, there's that diagram also. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is only the alpha dependent part. Yeah, because this log comes from the heavy light integral, right? So this is really the thing I care about to make the point. Um, yeah, any more questions about the full theory calculation? All right, 40 minutes. We'll see. We'll get there one way or the other. So let's move to the effective theory. So if I want to do a one-loop calculation, matching and running calculation, that means I need to match my operator coefficients at tree level. OK? So we already talked about matching C4 yesterday, right? It was trivial. Um, so we can just match this at threshold. In the effective theory, in the full theory, this tells us that, uh, what do I call it? Kappa equals C4 at mu high. OK? Let's do now the matching for phi to the sixth. So this is the only structure we can have, right? This is going to equal alpha squared uh, times the propagator, right? Um, with some i's and stuff that we'll get right. But uh, how many of these are there? This one's a little trickier. 42. 42. <laughs> That's close. Why 6 factorial? Because uh, there's 6 external legs and there's 3 symmetry factors. Uh, sorry, 2 symmetry factors and 3 things. Good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this is the, uh, I, uh, yeah, so you're right. Um, that's a combination, right? So it's six choose three, because you have six choices, and then you choose three and you put them on one side. Okay, that overcounts by a factor. Anybody see why? Sorry. Exactly. So that we overcounted by a factor of two when we did that, right? Because once we put three on this side, then putting three on this side is the same diagram. Good. So this is. 6 choose 3 with a half. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and expand the uh, propagator to leading power. So we got a minus 1 over minus m squared. Uh, a minus 1 over big M squared, right? The minus sign is because the propagator has a minus sign on the mass, right? Plus order lambda. OK. And that equals. Now in the EFT, right, so this was the full theory. This is the EFT. And we have minus I C6 over big M squared. Mm -hmm. If lambda is little m over big M, mm -hmm. that looks to me like that ought to be bigger than 1 over M squared, since M is a large number. So why do we have that first term goes essentially uh, lambda squared? We just we have all order lambda. No, this goes like one. There's no little. If you like, the little m's are really counting the power. Okay. So uh, so if we Taylor expanded the propagator, right? It was little m minus big M squared. Mm -hmm. We're Taylor expanding in little m. This is the leading term in that Taylor expansion, and I'm dropping the subleading terms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is why we picked big M squared for those of you who asked about it, right? Just for convenience, it's going to drop out. And now I just need to be careful about my factors of 2. Okay, So this gives me a 10. Uh, oh, I dropped an i, sorry. There's, a, there's an i here. Let's do the counting. Minus i times minus i times i for the propagator. So that's 1i. Uh, and it's plus 
because good, which is what I have in my notes. No, no, that came from the propagator. So the whole thing's going to be positive. That's why I got confused. Yeah. So there's a minus sign from what we just from the counting we just did, right? And then there's a minus sign from the propagator expansion. Okay. Um, good. So now we just compare these two coefficients. Remember, we're matching at the high scale, right? So this is at mu high. We have the relation between c6 and alpha, which is that c6 equals minus 10 alpha squared. Okay. That's kind of an odd number. We're going to see uh, that it all hangs together by the end. Um, you can kind of get a sense of this 10 from looking over here. At least the 5 part, there's a 3 and a 2. Okay, So they're factors of 2, right? E it's easy to get factors of 2. A factor of 5 is weird. right? So we already see there, that this weird factor of 5 that we got there is, uh, is, is agreeing with our tree level matching you know, at some tilde level. Yeah. Um, not at leading uh, from two to the f two of the five four. No, no. But in the EFT, very good. So in the EFT, those diagrams, if you like, are are um, you're going to use those diagrams to do calculations in the EFT, but you don't use them in the matching, right? Those involve the propagating light states, right? You'd have a light propagator connecting those, right? So there's no expansion of that propagator. Yeah. And we're never going to calculate any six point anything, so we're not going to have to include that diagram in it, in what we're going to do. Um, yeah, good. OK, so now we know our matching coefficient. We've got our effective theory uh, vertex right, with six points. Our process is phi phi to phi phi at threshold. So we can take this thing, close a loop, and, and get a contribution of phi phi to phi phi. OK, so let's do that. So there's a half because we have another one of these loops, right? For symmetry factor, c6 over big M squared, mu high to the 2 epsilon, integral dl, 1 over L squared minus little m squared. It's an integral we've now done, what, four or five times? So again, we get our power suppression from this loop because of the quadratic divergence. And um, it's times 1 minus epsilon plus log mu high bar squared. I was going to draw the bars over little m squared uh, plus 1 plus order epsilon. OK? So this. We can see, right, we need a counter term uh, in order to cancel this divergence, right? And that is going to be a counter term for the four point interaction. Okay? So we're going to absorb this divergence into the four point interaction. And so that tells us that we have really, so really I should have added to this the counter term diagram. Okay? And the counterterm diagram comes with a minus i delta 4 c4. Okay? This guy is minus i delta 4 c4. So now I can just figure out what delta 4, the, the contribution to delta 4 from c6 is, right, by doing ms bar. So I get minus i delta 4 has a term which is minus i um, 1 over c4. C6 over 32 pi squared, little m squared over big m squared, 1 over epsilon. Okay? Well, all I did was move the C4 over here because then I'm going to plug this into the formulas I wrote for you last time for the anomalous dimensions. Okay? So this is going to give us an anomalous dimension, which comes from taking the, um, the C6 derivative and then multiplying by C4. And we get that 
gamma 4, 6, which is a mixing term in the RGE, right? It generates four, a four point off the six point. This is now 1 over 16 pi squared, little m squared over big M squared. Okay, so we have a subleading contribution to our running from this diagram in the effective theory. Okay, so that's the piece we need to do this step. Right, so here we're going to use a gamma 4, 4 plus, and let me say, and gamma 4, 6 RGE, where this is the thing we did last time, and then this is the new thing we just computed. Okay? Furthermore, this is the only diagram in my effective theory at the high scale that can generate a subleading power operator for me. And so I'm going to be able to use this full result, not just the 1 over epsilon part, to do the matching step at mu high. Okay? So it's exactly what we did last time. We're going to set the two amplitudes, the full theory and the effective theory amplitudes equal to each other, and then find the matching term. And if I did it right, then all the log little m's better go away. My matching better be analytic in little m. So we have minus i c4 match at mu high. That is full minus EFT. Be careful, this is the renormalized, right? So I have to include the counter terms in both. Like we talked about last time, I have to carefully choose my renormalization prescription to be the same on both sides, okay? So that I'm doing everything self consistently, but I have, right? I've just done MS bar everywhere, so we're all good. I've kept all the finite terms around. I take this, uh, that, and I subtract this from it without the 1 over epsilon, right? Because I renormalized that. And I get the following. I alpha squared over 16 pi squared. Um, do I want to do? Okay, I'm going to do this. Save me some writing. So because we're matching at the high scale, okay, I know what C6 is at mu high, right? We derived it here. So I can just plug this in because I'm at the high scale, okay? This is not true below the high scale, but at the high scale, I can replace C6 by uh, minus 10 alpha squared, OK? And then, well, I should leave this down because I'm going to walk back and forth. So now let's look at what happens. Um, so I'm going to do some blackboard magic here and renormalize. Voila. And uh, so now this, this gets, uh, I take that and I subtract this, OK? And so here, my real point and is the little m dependence. So let's just look at that, all right? I've got a 1 over 16 pi squared with an alpha squared. I have three log m squareds and two more log little m squareds, OK? So that's my 5. And I come and I look here. 10 over 32 gives me 5 over 16, OK? I've got a minus sign here, but I've got my little m in the denominator. So. OK? All right. Um, and now I subtract this from that. And I see, let me do this just to make it super obvious, that all my log little m's go away. OK? Take a moment. Actually, I'll write the final match to answer while you're thinking. So I get, um, and I'm going to go back to the C6 language because I want to work in the effective theory.
Any questions? Oh, please. Then it would mean you had the wrong effective theory. Exactly. So this is the crucial test that your effective theory is at least a candidate to describe the IR of the full theory. Because your effective theory has to generate all of the IR divergences of the full theory. In the effective theory, we're regulating the IR with a little m. Okay? So the log little m's that show up are an avatar for the IR divergences in the effective theory. Okay? That's why they can't show up in this matched expression. Right? Because the, the, everything that's happening at the high scale, up to the fact that you really should think of this as little lambda, this is just some suppression, right? And anyway, it's analytic in M, so it doesn't matter. The, all of the non-trivial analytic properties proportional to little m have to be generated by the dynamics of the light particles in the effective theory, okay? So that's what we're checking when we do this matching calculation. We're seeing all of these log little m's get canceled because we're subtracting off the EFT at one loop, right, which is supposed to capture all the log little m's, okay? This is, this is the most important step today, so we should take our time. What if, um, this is silly, but what if we started with, uh, we chose our process to not refine it, we just worked with that? Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't worked it out, but um, the, Three phi to three phi. Would it give you any heavy light loops at one loop? Um, I don't think so. I think it gives you good. It doesn't give you because the diagram in the full theory is now just this, right? And there's no there's no there's no heavy light loop, right? The reason I chose this example was because of of a loop with a with a heavy mass and a light mass in it. That's how we got a log. Well, wherever it is, a log of big M over or little m over big M, right? Um, so the, uh, I mean, I literally, in generating this example, drew the integral that I wanted and then dressed it with some dumb scalar theory, right? Um, and so, uh, so I think this is, um, this is the simplest thing. It has this complication that this is only appearing at subleading power, but that's, again, because of this IR argument that I made. Um, so that's not a generic feature. That's just a feature of this particular example. Uh, that came from, there's a, uh, there's a 1, but then there's a, five, there's a 10 here, right? So that's a, uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's that 1 plus this 1, and then, and then there's a 10 here. Be very skeptical of my factors of 2. I, I really think I found all, all the main mistakes at this point, but uh, I'm not promising there aren't missing factors. Any more questions? Does the point make sense? Okay. Honestly, if you get this, then, then you don't have to listen to anything else I say. I'd be happy. Um, okay. So, let's now do the next step of our procedure. So, where are we? Let's go back to our running schematic. So, we have a matching contribution to the effective theory at the high scale. We have anomalous dimensions for running the four-point coupling both from its self-coupling and from the presence of the C6 operator, okay? This is going to generate leading power RGE evolution, which is what we derived last time. This is going to generate a subleading power RGE evolution, okay? Now, um, when I first showed my first attempt at this to one of my, uh, one of my EFT collaborators, who's a real expert, um, he was very upset with me because uh, I solved the RGE to all orders in this, and uh, from an EFT point of view, that's bad. Because the whole thing about the EFT is that there's a power expansion going on here, okay? So we can't do an infinite number of insertions of this if we're going to work consistently at some order in power, okay? So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you how to do this, we're going to solve the RGE to leading power in this operator, okay? So this is the one thing that I don't like about this example, is that it doesn't really resum the logs, but it, it'll do what I want it to do as far as showing you how to reproduce the whole story from a matching running and one loop calculation. Then tomorrow we'll see, we'll actually resum a log doing the same procedure in, in SCET, okay? Um, so that's actually, but I like, <laughs> then I turned around and I convinced him that actually it was nice because it demonstrates 
uh, power counting in action, that you really have to be careful about the power counting if you want to do this consistently. Okay? All right. So, yes. Yeah, please. Please. So, the C4 matching, mm -hmm. um, I'm right in thinking of this as some finite term that we add by hands to make sure that the two theories match at that scale? Correct. And so that, that's the reason why we need all of the small m's to go away, because we'd be adding a very large finite term to get them to match? No. That's okay. not why. Yeah. The, um, the reason why is because um, the physics at the high scale uh, needs to be analytic, as I said, little m to zero. Okay? Because the, um, it can't know about the IR divergence, the fact that little m exists, right? That would be like saying, I'm doing physics at a TeV and I care about the, say, electron mass, right? The approximation we're taking when we do this matching and running is that we expand the EFT, we treat all the light degrees of freedom as massless, right? And, um, and so, the, uh, so if a log little m appeared, it would be divergent, okay? Um, so in fact, the whole reason that we do this is so that the IR divergences cancel and we can evaluate this at the high scale. Okay? So, so you'll hear people, if you read EFT literature, you talk to some of these guys, you'll hear them talk about um, the, the IR of the theory is the same in the full theory and the effective theory. This thing that we just did is the check that you reproduce the IR of the full theory. Okay? And again, we're, we'll, we'll see this again tomorrow in a, in a less trivial example um, when we look at the Sudikov integral. But it'll be the same, it'll be exactly the same story. Um, match and C4 evaluated at the matching energy. Um, C4 at, so this is, yeah, yeah. In C6, as you were working at the threshold, you could plug in what you found for C6, but that's not C6 match, question? So, um, so there is a tree level contribution to C4, which is just C4, and then we add to it this matching contribution at the high scale. Okay, so it's not at the matching scale, it is what we're doing to match. Um, it, is, it is at the matching scale. It's evaluated at, at mu high. So at mu high, we have a tree level contribution to C4 from matching, C4 equals kappa. And then we have this contribution from matching, which guarantees that our full theory and the effective theory give the same answer. Okay? At least a leading log. Because once we resum, now our effective theory is capturing more than our full theory, right? This is why we do resummation. Uh, and we can restore the convergence of perturbation theory through that. Um, yes? No, no, my mu highs, if you track my mu highs, then, then everything works out, right? In fact, if, yeah, you can see it here, right? I have a subleading power mu high that only could have come from the mu high over there. That's an M, sorry. My handwriting might be. So this, no, no, this is a mu high. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure this part of it is right because we're going to reproduce it using another technique. But um, I have 15 minutes, so maybe um, let's let's check it offline. Well, you know you shouldn't, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think if you take five minutes, then um, then well, at least take five minutes and then tell me if you think I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I need to speed up just a little bit. So um, so let's let's solve the RGE unless there are any pressing questions. All right, so now we run. Here's our RGE. Uh, we're running the C4, right? This is the thing we care about. We have our anomalous dimension from yesterday. And then we have our new anomalous dimension that we just computed today, which is power suppressed. So we want to solve this perturbatively um, so, that, uh, so that my friend Ian won't, uh, won't assassinate me. And so this is what it looks like. Where what I've done is I've said, um, I want to write C4 
as a leading power contribution plus a subleading power contribution. Okay? And then I just plug it in, and here um, I've truncated to only the leading power and leading order and coupling contribution to the running. Okay? That's because the cross term here, which you might think I should include because it's only one factor of power suppression, is suppressed by extra factors of coupling constants. Okay? Um, so this is the leading power, leading coupling RGE. Okay? And now, this part is just what we did last time. Right? So I know the answer. Um, and I'm left, right? So if you like, this cancels this. And I have now a RGE for my subleading power operator. So I have DC4 at subleading power, D log mu equals 1 over 16 pi squared, little m squared over big m squared, C6. And that is trivial to solve. It gives me C4, 1. I'm going to run out of room, aren't I? Hmm. OK, I'm going to do it over here. It gives me um, C4, 1 at mu high plus 1 over 16 pi squared, um, little m squared over big m squared, C6 log mu low over mu high. OK? Sorry, this is, I mucked this up. This is uh, C4 at mu low equals this. OK? It's, a, it's, it's as easy as it gets, right? You just, you just move this over here. There's no C4 dependence. You just integrate both sides, right? So it's delta C4 equals log of mu low over mu high. Um, and then I'm interested in running from the high scale to the low scale, so I want to solve this for mu low, for C at mu low, right? Yeah, because it's both higher power and higher order in the couplings, right? So I'm working, there's these multiple expansions going on, right? So if you like, um, the C4, uh, the C4 zero is like um, kappa squared, and the C4 one goes like alpha squared, and so that's higher power in the couplings than just the kappa squared by itself or the alpha squared by itself. Right? Sorry, sorry, it's not... Shoot, it's the, the cross term, it's not kappa squared, it's kappa, right? It's um, C4, 0 goes like kappa, but C4, 1 goes like alpha squared. So it's kappa alpha squared versus this term is kappa squared and this term is alpha squared. Okay, so that's why it's higher power in the, higher order in the couplings. Okay. That's an alpha. They're just different expansions. So, so I'm working to the leading order in the coupling expansion and leading plus subleading order in the power expansion. OK. Um, oh, I have 10 minutes. Good. Uh, OK, so let's see. Leave the matching. We don't need this. So I think it's worth it's worth taking two minutes to write the whole the whole re RGE solution to this of this thing, and then we need to do one more loop calculation at the low scale. We'll have everything to to get our punchline. Okay. So putting it all together, I now have C four resummed at mu low equals C4 0 at mu high over 1 minus C4 0, 3 over 16 pi squared, log mu high over mu low. That's what we derived last time, plus C4 1 at mu high. That's our power suppressed matching contribution, right? That's the boundary condition at mu high. Plus 1 over 16 pi squared, m squared over big m squared, 
C6 log mu low over mu high, which is what we just computed over here. Okay? Finally, in order to get everything right, get all the pieces at one loop, I just need to calculate now one loop corrections at the low scale. So if you want to, if I, I'm a visual person, I like thinking about what did I do? I calculated one loop corrections in the full theory. I calculated one loop corrections in the effective theory butting up against mu high, and then I matched. Now I've just solved the RGE to leading power to run, or including subleading power to run down to mu low, okay? And now I'm at mu low, and I just calculate in the effective theory a loop of the effective theory states, right, at the scale mu low using my running coupling evaluated at mu low. Good? Yes? Yeah, because um, this thing we can insert an infinite number of times because it, there's no power counting cost, okay? Whereas this, right, comes with this, this factor of power suppression. And we have only worked to, uh, to this order in the power counting, right, including one factor of, of lambda squared. This, by the way, actually, thanks for the question, because this is a great place to point out that from this point of view, this is the difference between renormalizable and non-renormalizable theories. We've just kind of changed the language because we really don't care about that difference from this point of view. We just are careful to expand in lambda consistently, okay? If we went to higher order, we would then need to include extra subleading terms. They could crosstalk, right? We just, again, it's like a Taylor expansion, right? If you go to higher order, you've got to be careful about expanding everything correctly and carefully, right? Um, but, uh, but luckily to this order, it was, it was pretty straightforward. There was, there was only these couple of contributions and we didn't have to worry about crossing. Um, cross terms or anything. Yes? And how is C41 related to what we called C4 matching evaluated at that scale? It is the same. Exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because there was no tree level subleading power contribution to C4. There could have been a tree level contribution at subleading power, but there wasn't. Okay? Um, yes, that's right. Right? Because we had a C6 tree level subleading power contribution, but not a C4. Yeah, because if you, if you expanded C6 to next order, right, you get a little m squared over big m squared out of that expansion. So C6 includes a whole tower of, of higher and higher power operators. So if we went to the next order in the power counting, we would need to be careful about that, right? Yeah, you had a question? Okay, great. All right. Um, so what... Mm. Sorry, uh, Please, just, yeah. just following up. So yeah. C41 is just the C4 match? Correct. Uh, but I get the C4 match expression that we wrote down. Uh, oh, did it have? Actually, I have it here. That's why I kept it. Oh, good, good, good. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, thank you, thank you. This piece is C41. This piece goes in uh, C40. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The zero and the one is, 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 power, is counting the power. Absolutely, thanks. Sorry, I misstated. No, but alpha is not counting the power. Alpha is not the power suppression, right? The power suppression is the little m over big M. No, no, that superscript was power, was the lambdas. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe I should call it two. It's the first contribution. Thanks. That's probably confusing. Yeah, but it's just the leading. It's the subleading power contribution. Sorry, yeah. I, I switched from m squareds to not, and anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Any, anything else I, I made more confusing than it had to be? Um, all right, we're almost done, which is good. We have five minutes. So, um, right, where are we? I think I erased the one loop calculation. In the low scale theory, no, nope. yes, it's, yeah, it's not that. Okay, so we already did this, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write anything except the answer, um, right? We calculated when we did matching, we calculated our loop in the effective theory, right? Now the only difference from here to here is this loop is evaluated with mu lows instead of mu highs, okay? And we're using running couplings, so 
all the couplings have a mu low, right? Dependence. And any log that we have that has a mu in it, now it's mu low. So the one loop diagram at mu low gives me minus i c4 at mu low equals minus i c4 times 1 minus 3 over 32 pi squared c4 log mu low squared over m squared plus i c6 over 32 pi squared little m squared over big m squared log mu low squared over m squared plus 1. Okay, uh, so I, on purpose, I'm not telling you what scale these are evaluated at. That's because that's a higher order effect, okay? Um, so when we expand out, but we need everything evaluated at mu low, right? Uh, so that shows up here and here. So let's put it all together and see what we get. So I'm going to not worry about the finite terms. I'll track them when I write up the stuff in tech, but um, this is the most important thing is the logs. So I just want to show you how the logs separate and recombine. In principle, everything we did with matching, right, keeping track of all the finite terms, I think it's even right in my notes now, but um, I just haven't been focused on it, keeps all of those factors around uh, so that all this all this hangs together. Um, so we have this and let me replace this with a C6 over 10. And I need a minus sign. Um, Hmm. Okay, my notes are missing a minus sign. Let's see what happens. You might have to help me find it. Um, and I'm only going to worry about the subleading power part just for, for brevity, since I'm already out of time. Um, good. So, in terms of C6, because we're working at the low scale, let me write down all the pieces from the EFT. So I have a and this is with an I. This one had an I too. So I've got 1 over 10, 1 over 16 pi squared, C6, M squared over big M squared, times 3 log mu squared I over big M squared, plus 2 log mu high squared over mu high squared. I'm adding that to make it really obvious how everything combines. So that's, all, that's a zero, right? Um, and this is matching at mu high. Next, and this is at uh, what I've been calling one, which should be a two, okay? But let me not change notation. So this is all the subleading power stuff. Next, I have the RGE. Uh, the subleading power part gives me the following factor. So I have minus i, 1 over 32 pi squared, little m squared over big m squared, c6, log mu high squared over mu low squared. Where it's a 16 there and a 32 here because I squared them so that they agree with the others, right? This is my 4 minus 2 epsilon. This is the RGE. And finally, I have the finite terms at the low scale that I just wrote up there. So I have a minus i, 1 over 32 pi squared, m squared over big M squared, c6 log mu low squared over little m squared. These are the finite terms at mu low. So this is, are the formulas that, are, that uh, Right, uh, that that diagram was representing, right? I match, I run, I match, okay? And 
let's see what happens. So I have here, let's track the mu highs. So I've got Um, it's about to be obvious, uh, but this is a zero. I just added zero, but I wanted to make it really obvious how everything combines. Right, so this is zero. This came from here, right? Um, and yeah, so uh, actually the matching is still on the board, right? It's somewhere, uh, or it might be in your notes. Oh yeah, it's over here, right? So um, I'm only looking at this term, right? So that's the three log squared mu high over m squared here, and then I added zero because I need a five. All right, so I've got three plus two. Okay, so I've got five log mu high squared divided by 10. That gives me one over 32 of them. All right, that cancels my mu high squared here. Let's look at the mu lows. I've got one over 32 of them mu low squared. That cancels my one over 32 of them here. Oh, I have a sign wrong. Um, Oh, good, good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. Um, so, what did we do? All right, so you see, right, if I add all this up, I get back to, um, to a term that looks like this. So, what did we do? We took this log, which had no mu dependence, right? So we had no way to resum it with the RGE. Because it, the RGE is d log mu, right? d by d log mu. So by using effective field theory, we matched, we removed the log little m dependence and swapped it for a mu high. And now that we have mu high, we have an RGE, right? Then we run the RGE from the high scale to the low scale. That gives us a log that connects the high scale to the low scale. If this weren't subleading power, this would be some non-trivial function of the log. And then we would tailor expand it to get the leading order log, and this, would, this whole story would have to play through. Okay? Here, there was that one simplification, if you like, that we only resummed the leading log uh, because of the power expansion. Okay? Uh, let me just say the last thing. And then right, we get down to the low scale, where, um, where the, little m, the log little m dependence reemerges right by computing loops in the effective theory at the low scale. And what we have is we can take the natural scale at the high scale. So this is the last critical thing. If we take mu high of order m, we take mu low of order little m, and you imagine this is a resumming function, right? So it doesn't care how big the log gets because it resums logs. It's the RGE. There's no more large logs. This is 0. This is 0. This is 0. And the RGE resums all of the possible large logs for us. OK? So that's how, that's how it works. That's the whole story. All right? Yeah, you had a question. I don't answer my question, but uh, when we added up the mu log mu h squared, uh, do you still have one from the denominator and the term that's about a 0? Um, so that is this one. Yeah, so I need to reproduce this, this full theory renormalized result to leading log. And here, again, I really want to emphasize that this is already leading log, right? Because of the power expansion, the RGE doesn't resum the log. But if, it were, if we hadn't power expanded it, if you plug that differential equation into uh, Mathematica, it'll give you some awful uh, tangent thing, which looks like a resummation. Uh, and then you can expand it to leading log and get this back. But, um, but that violates the rules of the game, because that includes higher order in power. Um, More questions? Yeah, please. The matching term is uh, correct. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so these are these two approaches to using effective theory. One way, you just write down all the possible terms consistent with the symmetries, and you get the coefficients from experiment, if you like. Here. We imagine that the high scale theory gave us coefficients from experiment, or maybe they're God given, whatever. And then the point of matching and running is to resum large logs that would have, um, that would have spoiled the perturbation theory in the full theory, right? So the, 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 the whole point of this, right, the reason that we took that heavy light log, that this is the example we're doing, is because 
if you have a full theory with two widely, widely separated scales, at some log order, you're going to get a large log. Okay? And so if you want to restore the convergence of perturbation theory, you need to play this game, separate this, the scales inside the log, resum that log, and then sort of put everything back together. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I mean, this is, this is what they, the, the practitioners would sometimes call this matching, but it's really just computing the one loop corrections at the low scale. Because we're working, let's talk about, remember what order we're working at, right? We're working at one loop order um, to uh, subleading power, right? So if we're going to do that consistently, we need to calculate all one loop subleading power contributions in the low energy theory. Yeah, but you can think of this as matching because it's kind of the same thing, right? You're, you're, you're matching at the low scale. You're adding these finite terms at the low scale to, uh, to make everything work out. That's right. And the reason that the leading term, um, I mean, well, we did the leading term yesterday. And it was boring because there was nothing there was nothing mysterious about it. We calculated in the full theory. We saw a log of mu. And then we just used the kalins abanzic equation to literally pull the coefficient of that off because it's d, d log mu, right? Here, how do you take d, d log mu of, of this term? It has no mu's in it, right? So that was the whole point of this exercise, right? I thought it was worth an hour and 15 minutes of your time to show you, well, now we're at 25, to show you uh, how to take this log apart using, using these techniques. And again, the, the physics here is, um, sh is really simple, right? It's just, it's just locality. It's telling you that any of this non-analyticity in M has to be generated by the effective field theory if you got the right IR description, right? So, so again, I, I've, that's the big picture here, is that your effective theory generates the IR of the full theory, right? That's what we mean by an effective theory, and this is what it looks like mathematically. This is how you know that that's what it did, okay? All right, so tomorrow, um, I'm going to show you how to do this with the method of regions. And then we're going to move to SCET. So probably tomorrow we'll mostly be um, showing you light cone uh, coordinates. And, um, and we'll talk about scalings. And I hope we'll do the method of regions for the Sudikov integral. And then Friday, um, we'll resum that Sudikov integral. Uh, we'll resum that Sudikov log with this uh, new kind of EFT, this soft collinear effective theory. Okay? Um, so that's, that's the plan for the rest of the time. But it's really just this again in a, uh, in a kind of more complicated looking effective theory. Okay? So, um, yeah, so bug me about this. If you understand this, then the rest of the lecture is, um, should be a lot of fun. All right. Thanks again.